All right. Hey guys. Um, so for those who haven't met, uh, I'm Nick. I'm one of the um, I'm the clinic chief for the residents this year. So I will be giving this talk, uh, Rapid Response 101. We have not done this talk before, um, but we figured uh, new interns this year, it's kind of a good skill to have. Um, it's something you'll encounter throughout your whole residency. Um, so good to have exposure early. Quick outline for the talk. Um, this is not meant to be super serious. Um, it's really just meant to give you an introduction onto what a rapid response is, why it is we call this, um, we have a lot of our team members for the rapid responses here. They'll say hi at some point. Um, and then I'll walk you through the steps of the rapid response and then kind of some of the common scenarios that we see every day. So why we call rapid responses. So it's really a hospital wide um, movement to really find patients outside of the ICU who are at risk for clinically deteriorating and then finding them before that happens um, based on their labs and vitals and then putting them in a safer environment. So Really the goal is to recognize it early, get as many people as you can who can assess the patient uh, to the room early and lay eyes on them and then figure out, do they need to stay on the floor? Do they need to move the ICU? And ultimately the outcome that you wanna um, intervene on is their safety. Um, so that's the whole purpose of this really. Um, as far as evidence, so it all really started um, with trying to reduce the amount of cardiac arrest and unplanned trips to the ICU outside of the, um, just from the floor services. That's where all the early data came. Um, so originally started in Australia in the early 2000s, they implemented what was called a medical emergency team, not a rapid response team. Um, so they tried, they did a randomized trial at 23 different sites and they actually found out it like really didn't reduce their uh, outcome that they wanted. But then when they looked back at uh, data, data after the initial results, they found that the hospitals that were using it more efficiently, that were using um, in greater volume, the rapid response team actually had better results. Um, and then there was a JAMA paper in 2019 that actually looked at the top performing hospitals um, compared to the ones that weren't performing as well. And they found that the ones that were performing better had designated rapid response teams. They had nurses that were designated to just come to rapid responses and not have other clinical duties or nurses on the floor that felt empowered to be able to call rapid responses without judgment from um, doctors. And that was based on a lot of the surveys that they took. Um, so why do you need to know this as an intern? You might be thinking, oh, I'm doing a lot of the orders, um, writing the notes, the rapid response is more of a senior thing. That's not always true. Um, so you guys will be coming to rapid responses. Um, your senior might be busy doing admission or maybe at a different rapid response and you'll be the only one at the room. So it's important you guys at least know the steps. You don't have to know everything. You can at least start the process and then get help later. Um, but it's, it's really important you guys familiarize with the process. Um, so who's on the team? So usually it's the 4RN who calls a rapid response. It doesn't have to be, but most of the times it is just because they're with the patient more frequently. Um, there's ICU nurses that are, a lot of them are here um, that come to the rapid responses after. There's um, a nursing supervisor and respiratory therapist at these rapid responses too. If, right, if you're at Loyola, there's often a chaplain. And then as far as uh, which one of us should be at rapid responses. So at Loyola, it's actually the primary team physician. Should, if it's you guys and it's your patient from your team, you guys should be the one that's at the rapid response. Um, but the MICU used to go to these and now they, it's just the team on the floor that goes to them now. Um, if you're at Heinz, it's anyone who's carrying the code pager. If it's your um, team during the day, you should be at them if you're the primary team. Same if you're the on-call resident at night with the code pager. And then there's, of course, there's the MOD, the NOC, um, who are also at these. So it gets a little busier at Heinz, but generally the rule is if it's your patient, you should be at the rapid response. Um, now, um, some of our nurses are here, so I'm just going to have them stand up and introduce themselves. Um, Haley's here as well. She's not listed here. Thank you for coming. Um, but if you guys want to just one by one, maybe just stand up and introduce yourself and give a quick tip to the interns. Um, I've probably been on this rapid response team for over 10 years. And um, I just wanted to also say 
that we do have sometimes called rapids for non inpatients, and in that case, we would take them to the emergency room because I we had incidences where we respond and people are like, Where's your crash card? and that type of thing, and really, we just want to take them right to the emergency room to get them admitted and get taken care of. Thank you. Hi, I'm Neely. Um, I'm on the nurse with us by seal. Um, the only thing I would say to even help you guys out is we've had times where you guys don't come to the rapids and like all we need is like a special hydrology or something that you guys still show up and we have to make that money to the ICO. So this actually is one of the things that works. And we a lot of times, we, not a lot of times, but sometimes they still need the ICO. We just need a sort of alert from you guys. And if you guys are there, then we can avoid it. Hi, I'm Amber Purdy. I'm from Heinz. We are a designated team. Um, part of my best advice, and I heard this from a resident several years ago, we carry a pink box with some medications in it. And we don't know where you're going. One of the residents said, oh, follow the pink box. So if you're Heinz, if our people who follow the pink box, we'll get to the <laughs> Hi, I'm Anna Jan, also one of the alternatives from Heinz. And um, as you said, follow the pink box and we'll be there with you. I'm Jazz or Jasmine. Um, I don't know what the question was, but advice. Um, <laughs> if you don't know something, just ask any of us, whether it's the rapid response nurses or the nurse with the website. So don't guess, just talk to one of us. Thanks, guys. Jazz actually just biked here on her day off. So uh, <laughs> thanks for coming. Um, and yeah, actually, the point of not being inpatient rapid responses happens more than you think. Actually, at yeah, Jasmine's is like pretty frequent. Or the cafeteria at Heinz, yeah. Like we'll happens. <laughs> yeah. So there's something to look out for. Um, and then who's uh, out of the nurses? Who's actually carrying the pager? So I think for Loyola, right, it's a rotating um, ICU. Yeah, it just used to be the pager, but now we rotate ICUs. Right. So you always know. That's also another thing because like it used to be us just going, so we would like tell you guys. Mm -hmm. If like. It'll be a NICU patient, but they bring like the current ICU. They necessarily don't tell you guys. So I just like check out that like. And there's a there's a backup too, right? There's a yeah yeah yeah, but it's just like easier. It's just us to come back to it. And then at Heinz, so um, there's actually designated rapid response nurses who don't who their job is literally to, to monitor patients who are at risk for rapid responses and um, talk to you guys before that happens. Um, see if there's any assessment before we, you know, really the goal to minimize any like crash rapid responses or code blues on the floor. So they'll actually start um, one to two rotating, right? Right, Jess? Um, so one to two rotating per um, day, we'll actually follow patients who are um, within 72 hours of ICU transfer. If they have a new score that's between uh, five to six, I, I believe four to, yeah. Um, and if they're notified by, Tally, or if they're notified by the nurse that they're worried about these, they'll start monitoring these patients. And they're really, the job is to prevent um, worse outcomes down the line. So they're really, you know, they're here to help. So um, listen to them, they're part of your team. So um, it'll be really helpful moving forward. Um, as far as what the actual rapid response team does, these guys already kind of touched on it a little bit, but your job is to have the team kind of look at the patient, assess what their needs are. Do they need fluids? Do they need different meds? Should they be on the floor? Should they go to the ICU? That should be kind of the first things you're thinking of. You want to stabilize the patient, whether it's to stay on the floor or to at least get them to the ICU, give them the meds that they need at that moment. And then to communicate this, not just with the rest of the team, but also, you know, the patient should know what's going on. Like, sir, um, we're worried about you at this moment. We're going to move you to the ICU for these reasons. If he's not able or she's not able to communicate talk to the family and let them know as soon as they go to the ICU, or even if they don't, if you're, if you're still worried about them, just give them an update, kind of any clinical change that you see in the patient. And then uh, educate and support, this, this could be for anyone really, but to like, if they're staying on the floor, let the team know this is the plan for now, we'll continue to watch them, let me know if you need anything. And then if you are gonna send the patient to the ICU, assist in the transfer, so don't just say, they need to go to the ICU and then walk out of the room and then just assume that it happens stay with the patient until at least the ICU team's there and they say that we have this from here because you don't want to like have the, just assume that the patient's safely going to go down to the ICU because that's, that's not the case. 
Um, and then a word on etiquette. One of the reasons we don't have the ICU team come to all these rapids now is because there were actually a pretty significant amount of voice reports, at least on the Loyola side. Um, you know, this often happens at night. Um, we, you know, we all get tired, we get cranky. This is a team response. We're here to help each other. And really the goal in mind is to take care of the patient. So I, it, it gets really easy to kind of you know, just start yelling orders when you go to a rapid response. But, but really, you know, when you get there, say, hi, I'm so-and-so, I'm part of this team, um, just to kind of introduce yourself at first, listen to other people that are at the rapid. You probably know the least about the patient when you first get there. So really listen to what other people in the room are saying first, and then be calm. You don't want to freak everyone else out when you don't know what's happening. Just listen to people. It'll also calm the patient down too if, if you're acting calm. And then don't judge. So if you think this, you know, this is kind of not the greatest reason for a rapid response, um, don't say that. Just listen to everyone, you know, because if you kind of push it off, whoever called that rapid response is going to be less likely to call it next time. And the, the patient could end up being compromised because of it. And then utilize SBAR. So I actually didn't know what SBAR was before this. Um, it's you don't have to memorize this mnemonic. It's more of just kind of a template that you guys can use to just um, structure the encounter a little bit better. So there's an activator and there's a responder for all these rapid responses. So the activator who called the rapid response, they should be able to tell you all of the events that were kind of, you know, concerning to them, why they called the rapid response, maybe a little bit about the patient. You as the responder should then ask, okay, why is this patient in the hospital? Maybe a little bit more background information on the patient's medical history or what meds they're on. And then from there, you can start making an assessment. Now, you do not have to be right. You don't have to like pinpoint exactly what their diagnosis is when you get in there. Um, you're probably not gonna know, but you wanna be able to at least, you know, voice some of your reasoning, say like, hey, this is what I'm thinking. Let's try this. Ask your senior if you're not sure. Even, you know, the IC nurses at this point have been to a lot more than these than you guys have. You know, ask them what, what we think we should do and then kind of work together as a team. Um, you don't have to be right. You just have to, you know, be transparent in what you're thinking. And then whatever recommendations you guys come up with, you know, say it as a team um, and then kind of assess how you're doing after you give the whatever treatment it is. Um, so when do we actually call a rapid? Um, so this is really any significant change in vitals. This is your patient who was doing great during the day, walking and talking and speaking. And now all of a sudden they're your sternal rub rubbing them to, to wake them up. And then if you're just at all just concerned about this patient, if you think they're going to get worse throughout the night, that's when you should call a rapid as well. Like I said, it doesn't have to be the nurse. You guys can call these rapids too. Um, really anyone can call a rapid. You just send a simple page. Um, so I actually didn't know what the, the ooze was in any of these, I don't know if you guys did, but it's an early warning score. So here at Loyola, we use a MUSE or a modified early warning score. And then at Heinz, um, they've recently started using the NUSE, so the national early warning score. It's just a set of vitals and then the, um, any change in mental status that kind of cues you into whether or not um, this patient should have a rapid call or not. And the goal, which I'll say this again, is really to prevent any patient deterioration and to assess these patients early. So you'll see rapid, um, rapid response, respiratory rate, blood pressure, heart rate, mental status and temperature as part of the MUSE. And then the orange is your um, oxygen set and your supplemental O2. Those are um, incorporated in the new score, which is actually a newer um, score. So anyone gets an RRT called if you're five or above for a MUSE on the floor here, or if you're seven above at Heinz. Is that you guys have too? Yeah. A um, little background. So like I said, um, it's really meant to prevent uh, worsening of the patient's clinical status. So I think um, what was reported is three to 5% of patients outside of the ICU eventually go to the ICU or even worse have mortality. So this was implemented um, really in the early 2000s as a way to capture their labs and their vitals and to prevent anything catastrophic from happening on the floor. Um, so MUSE was first um, done in 2001 in the UK and then more recently in 2012, um, the NUSE, which was thought to be a little more sensitive with those two added measures um, was added. Um, this is just more background data, but there was a JAMA paper in 2020 that looked at five different scoring systems, news and music included, and they retrospectively looked at um, a lot of different hospitals in California and Illinois. We were actually one of these hospitals, um, and they wanted to basically see, are these scoring systems sensitive in capturing ICU transfers and mortality? So 
on the left is in hospital mortality and on the right is their composite outcome of ICU transfer mortality. And you can see that out of all of the scores, actually the, the news and the mu's were the two most sensitive. So that's why we use those today. Um, for you guys, the, the background data is great, but this is actually how you can use the mu's before RAP is called. Um, this was taken out of an ICU. So these are sicker patients, but um, if you guys ever cross covering um, or just have, want to look at the patients on your team, you can actually sort them by MUSE. Um, so you'll see at the bottom, those are the patients you're not worried about as much. But then once you start getting to a four, so that it starts turning yellow and then five and above is red. So it's just an easier way for you to recognize um, sicker patients on your service. So um, that all being said, now we'll go to kind of the more common things that we see why rapid responses are called, um, just kind of common scenarios. So I'll, I'll say that before we even start, um, for all these scenarios, your physical exam is kind of your best tool. Um, as the, you know, a lot of times when we do physical exams on like daily rounds, it doesn't really change um, from that, that much from day to day. This, this is the point where it does. If someone was worried enough about to call, to call a rapid response. So you really wanna do an exam and see, okay, how is their mental status? Do they have equal um, breath sounds? Is their heart rate regular? All those things that could actively change during a rapid response. Um, Cause there's been so many that I've been to, I don't know about you guys, but like the doctor does not even place like their stethoscope on the chest and we're start, we start giving all these orders ahead of time. So um, it's just useful to have. As like a side note, um, or embarrassing story. When I was an intern, the first rapid response that I led by myself um, was in the MICU in like the second half of the year. And the senior said, you know, Nick, you're doing a great job. Why don't you lead this next rapid response? And I'll just watch you the rest of the night. I'm like, sure. Um, so I go to a rapid response. It was an altered mental status in a 90 year old lady. Um, and I see, you know, she's very altered when I get there. And I just start saying, all right, basic labs, um, infectious workup. Can someone get an ABG kit? And then we just start you know, staring at this patient and she didn't have a pulse. Um, she was DNR, did not have a pulse and she had been dead for two hours, we found out after. Um, so, I mean, that's something I like look back, I'm like, wow. Uh, <laughs> but, but like clearly like no one else was like, we weren't doing an exam before we like started shouting all these orders. So don't be like me, be better than me. We'll go through some common scenarios. Um, so as far as dyspnea, you're going to get this all the time. The patient who's short of breath, you guys will go to the room. Um, I think Dr. Simpson's giving a dyspnea lecture next week, so I won't step on his toes. But um, if you guys have never seen the dyspnea um, pyramid, it's a great teaching topic for what um, your med students on service. But really, there's only a few, there's a few main or organs that contribute to someone who's short of breath, lungs, heart, um, blood, and if there's an acid-base disturbance. So, you know, these are all the differentials and there's many, many more, but if you order these things um, at a rapid response, you're almost always at least um, starting off on the right um, foot, make sure they're alive. Um, but ABG, CBC, you know, cardiac workup with EKG and tropes and a BNP, and then of course a chest x-ray. Of course you can do an echo, you can do a CTP, but that's kind of further down once you start really um, narrowing your differential. And then as far as next steps, put them on oxygen if you need them. You can escalate. There's respiratory in the room. So, you know, even if you're eventually going to intubate the patient, you're getting ready to do so. Um, and then NEBS and Lasix are almost always like um, kind of rapidly ordered during these. As far as heart rate, so, you know, you want to know is it fast or slow? Are they stable or unstable? That's going to lead you down a different algorithm. What's one thing if someone's tachycardic, you're going to order for everyone? Was that? Did I hear EKG? So you're going you're gonna to get, like, they're going to be on tele. You're going to get an EKG for almost everyone. So this is going to be a whole lot different treatment than this. Very different treatment than that. So, you know, ordering an EKG when someone's tachycardic is kind of reflex. And then from there, is this different from their old EKGs? You want to look at their old EKGs. Are they on any cardiac meds already? Are they on tele? Is this a sudden change? And then if CARDS is following during the day and something weird happens at night, a lot of times they have anticipatory guidance anyway. Um, so you can kind of look back at their notes and see what they said. Um, what about if someone's hypotensive? So the, the rapid response for someone's hypotensive, are you gonna just go in there and just give them fluids? Probably not, right? So you're gonna wanna, again, assess them. Are they, are they wet? Are they dry on exam? 
how much fluid have they gotten through the day? So if they're, if you're in there and you're giving them their fourth, you know, bolus for the day, you probably should start thinking about something else. Probably start thinking about getting them to the ICU. If they're in shock or cardiogenic shock and you're giving them a bunch of fluid, probably not the best idea. Also, did they just receive their nighttime meds and now they're dipping a little bit low? And then looking at their baseline trends. So if they're always, you know, 90 systolics and now they're 85 and sleeping, maybe it's okay. But if they're usually 140s and now they're, you know, even low hundreds, that's kind of a sudden change. Um, and then if obviously if they have heart failure, renal disease, you're going to want to look at these patients a little more closely. And then Dr. Ozark is on vacation um, in Yosemite. She's not here at this one, but um, this is what the ultrasound's for. So this is another plug for the ultrasound. You know, look at their IVC. Do they have good LV function? It's just going to be another way to augment your physical exam. Um, so another plug for the ultrasound. Um, and then altered mental status. So this is the one that, that I went to, but really is the patient protecting their airway? Uh, you really want to check for neuro deficit soon and then see when was the last time they were normal. So is this a sudden change or is they've kind of been slowly getting worse throughout the day? These are questions if you do call a code stroke that the neuro um, residents kind of want to know. And then of course, if they were on any sedating meds, um, you'll want to know that too. Um, basic workup, all of the usual basic labs with the TSH, infectious workup. And then um, AccuCheck is something we don't always um, think about, but definitely check their sugar. Um, and then CT head, of course, if you're thinking about something intracranial. Um, I will say for potential treatment in terms of reversal agents, you wanna be careful, especially if someone's on benzo and you give them flumazenil, um, you can cause a withdrawal seizure. So just be careful. Um, most of the time you guys get called, it is gonna be some sort of delirium. Try to reorient them. Um, of course, the Haldol's there if you need it. Check your QTC beforehand. Um, one to one sitter. There's been residents, I think, that used to get um, warm glasses of milk for delirium patients. You don't have to go that far, but definitely you can like escalate slowly if you need to. Can you tell if someone's protecting their airway? Oh, that's a good question. So I think I think um, Dr. Simpson gives this lecture too, but a lot of times they'll just have the look, and you'll see this patient is altered. Um, this is usually the point where you call your senior. The gag reflex will also yeah. make a big difference there. That assessment, I did not learn that until recently. And check if they're alive. Check if, <laughs> just check if they're alive. <laughs> um, so fever, another one we commonly get called for. This is, again, these are all going through the, the MUSE algorithm. Um, you're going to see this a lot. So ordering the basic things is um, an easy first step. So First question, is this a new fever? Have they been spiking fevers all day long? Um, have they been cultured? So you, you guys will see once you start putting in a lot of orders that you actually can't culture someone within the first, within 24 hours of already being cultured. But if they haven't, then definitely order blood cultures. Um, are they on antibiotics? And actually you can also check, are they getting MRSA coverage? Are they getting pseudomonal coverage? Um, all of these things, because you can broaden them overnight as well. And then um, Hina just gave a great lecture on uh, hemonc emergencies, but if they're neutropenic, you're going to definitely, this is, this is an emergency, they need to be on antibiotics, and you'll go down that algorithm if they are. Um, and then, of course, Tylenol if they're due for Tylenol. Um, and then as far as workup, so you're, you'll get a blood culture, UA, and chest x-ray on everyone. If they're having more respiratory symptoms, you can get a rest PCR, or um, you can get stool culture if that, or stool PCR if that's indicated as well. And then just some more um, common scenarios that we see. So you guys will all at some point get called to look at a toilet with blood in it. Um, it just happens, but the, especially at night. But your first quest, question, like all these other ones, is this patient um, stable or unstable? Then you can start thinking, is this an upper GI bleed? Is this a lower GI bleed? That's going to um, change some of your, your treatment later. Um, evaluation. So the GI doctor is going to ask you for a DRE. I'd say if they're active, actively hemorrhaging, you probably don't have to do that. Um, but definitely get vitals, get orthostatics to um, CBC, coags, and a typing screen. And then uh, consent that patient for blood if you're worried about them. Eventually, um, once you do all of that, make sure that they have adequate IV access. Um, give them fluids, at least while you're waiting for the blood. This is where you get your um, typing cross. And then if it's an upper GI bleed, get an IV PPI. Um, you'll have to call pharmacy to do that. And then call your GI fellow. I know that's not what you want to do in the middle of the night. And um, sometimes we get pushback for it. But again, this is all about helping our patient. Um, if you do all of these things ahead of time, um, it's going to be much easier when you call the, the GI fellow.
Um, and then chest pain. So, so this one's a little more um, just about taking the history. So is this new chest pain? Um, you really want to get um, a better description of um, where it's located, what makes it worse, all those kinds of things. If this patient has a history of CAD or stents in the past, you're more likely to go down an ACS route. Um, and you want to see if this is anginal or not. Workup, like I said before, um, it's kind of a no-brainer to do EKG. Yeah, somebody's in mute. Thank you. Um, and then you get a chest x-ray too, just to rule out any other causes. Um, and then falls. So this is something that we uh, pretty frequently see. Um, at least I did as an intern. So any patient that falls really, you're going to want to see this patient right away. You're going to ask, did they hit their head? Did they lose consciousness? Because if they did, that's lower threshold for you to order a head CT. Um, I'd say in any fall, but especially if they did either of those two things. And then you want to see, you know, are they on anticoagulation? Was their bed precautions um, the way they should have been in terms of height of bed if they had rails up? And then your next steps will be doing a thorough neuro exam, making sure they don't have any neuro deficits. And then, like I said, low threshold for head CT, especially if they had any of the things above. And then from there, document the fall, you know, say that this patient did not hit their head, lose consciousness, or if you did get a head CT, just kind of to put why. And then make sure that when you leave the room that it's less likely to happen again. So making sure that they have all of their proper um, fall precautions. Um, and then alcohol withdrawal. So this one you'll get called about pretty frequently too. Um, so once they start having really rapidly increasing Ativan requirements, if their CWAS get probably around 20s um, or uh, if they're having any major symptoms, tachycardia is a really common one. You'll start getting called for this as well. Um, usually the biggest things you want to know is when was their last drink? Cause that'll kind of cue you into this is in line for when they should be having withdrawal symptoms. Have they had complicated withdrawals um, in the past needing maybe ICU stays? And then are they on any other drugs that could have kind of explained these symptoms instead? Um, and then, the, you know, they might need fluids. They might need additional benzos. Um, usually once they start getting to this point, though, it's, it's pretty easy to, for them to go to the ICU, either for an Ativan drip or phenobarbital, something like that. And then um, as far as additional therapy, so sometimes someone's going to need to go on a DIL trip or an amio drip. You can actually do that on the floor. So I think it's three southeast here right? Three Southeast here and then seven for Heinz. Um, so they can still get those drips over, over there. You don't have to send them to the ICU. Um, but really, once you start thinking about things, um, I, I put Q4 or more um, can stay on the floor. Um, that's, that's probably the easiest way of thinking it. You, you kind of have to talk to the nurses more about anything that's going to be less than that. I'd say if you are going to do, you know, especially suctioning, neurochecks, NEBS, all those things, less than four hours, they're probably going to have to go to the ICU, at least for that night. Do you guys have anything else to add for that? Okay. So neuro checks at Heinz can be Q2. I think here they would still have to go at least initially to the ICU. Yeah. Right. And, and, and the first, the first step usually is going to be Q1 um, from Q4, but um, yeah, at least here at Loyola, they have to go to the ICU first, and then they can step down after, but they can't go step down from the floor. Um, and then you'll get, at the end of the rapid response, you guys will get the question, do you want rainbow labs? I think I remember that as an intern. I'm like, what are, what are rainbow labs? Do you, do you guys want rainbow labs? Sure. So I didn't know what they were, but yeah. Um, so for the, the, the rainbow refers to the different... Um, caps on the vial. So when they draw them, they're going to literally draw every vial. Um, the ones that are, that are probably the most important to you are the CBC, the CMP, the trope, lactate, and coax. Um, but since they're rainbow, you can go back and add um, labs on later that you need that are more specific um, to your patient. Um, so what are the next steps now? So we've, we've called the rapid. Um, we think the patient's safe. Um, so really you want to communicate the plan again. So make sure that everyone who's involved knows what's going to happen. Um, if they're staying on the floor, that's fine, but you just have to tell the nurses, you know, this will be, we'll, we'll check on them later. Um, we'll do this for now and kind of see how they do. If you need to get vitals more frequently than Q4 immediately, like if you want to give a fluid bolus and then see how they do like 30 minutes to an hour later, that's fine to start with. But then once you're doing that over and over, then at that point, you should probably be thinking about escalating. 
Um, as far as updating, I kind of already mentioned this. So let the, let the patient know what's going on. Um, I think we often forget to do that. And then definitely the family too, if they, if they can't speak for themselves. And then, like I said, kind of see what you're doing. The last thing you want to do is like tell the, the team in the morning, like, yeah, they were, you know, seventies over forties. I gave 500 CCs and haven't heard anything since. Like you want to say, yeah, they, they, they're hundreds over sixties. Now they responded to fluids. Um, they're doing much better. Their mental status improved. You don't want to just leave the patient there and kind of just assume that everything got better if you didn't hear anything. So definitely check in on these patients throughout the night. Um, go back to your Epic, see if their MUSE score is improving, check in with the nurses, and then see the patient later. Um, that all being said, so um, you guys have seen Ben Schmidt, um, maybe on, on TikTok or Instagram, whatever one he's most famous for. Um, he's a great resident here, and he's got all these um, pretty good videos online. Um, so I'll just show you one on rapid responses. Hey everyone, I'm the ICU resident. What's the story? I'm the rapid response nurse. The patient's Mr. Jones. He suddenly became altered and that's when Tim, the floor nurse, gave me a call. Yeah, he was completely fine an hour ago. What are his vital signs? He's tachycardic and a little hypoxic. Okay, start oxygen. We did. Again, an EKG. Already did. Are we drawing labs? Yeah, of course. Already done. Do you want an ADG? Oh, uh, Yes, good, it's already done. Okay, good. Okay, now you're the senior resident and you have to decide. Is this guy stable for the floor or does he need to come to the ICU? We could wait until his lab's back. I'd like to see his ABG, but he's only on two ribs. He got altered so suddenly, so we should probably make sure he doesn't have a new infection. Maybe we should just bring him to the ICU to be safe. Nice work. Now inform them of your plan. I think we should move him to the ICU. What? I said, I think we should move him. I see you. Yeah, I heard you, but they already moved him. But I'm the resident, so the rapid response nurse assessed him and had him move to the ICU while you were kind of staring off into space. <laughs> ah, very good. Carry on. I'll go back and I'll, I'll go see him. He's got a lot of those. But yeah. You um, have to tell them down back. Huh? <laughs> yeah. And I, I mean, in Hines, we don't move any patients without the resident's consent. Right, right. <laughs> Absolutely. That, that response team nurse does not make any decisions. I think he's in St. Louis now, so I don't, I don't know what they, they did over there. Yeah. Um, so guys, just to summarize again, and this is really just to get an intro, the goal is to prevent patients from, yeah, the, the patients really, um, the point is to prevent the patient from getting sicker and to provide them the safest environment as possible. We're working as a team. Um, the nurses are, the nurses, the RTs, everyone, we're just trying to um, provide the, the best atmosphere for the patient for them to get the best care. Um, use the Muse, use the news, whichever one, um, whether you're a Heinz or Loyola, these will kind of cue you into the, the sicker patients on your service. And then communication is key with your whole team, with the patient and with the patient's family. And then you do not have to know all of this um, by any means. Like we're here for, the seniors are here for you. The, the nurses are here for you. If you don't know, that's okay. Just be transparent, ask for help when, when needed, and just be nice to everyone who's at the Rapid. Um, so these are references. Do you guys have any questions? So it, they should eventually um, page the primary service, but the first one's going to be to the actual um, Rapid pager. I know at Heinz, it, it's going to go just to the code pager, I believe. Um, but they should they should be notifying the primary team. They'll say who the patient is, and then you'll have to look on your list and see if that's your patient. That's usually the easiest way to do. Um, so that's why when people are working in like the sixth floor workroom, you're like your your head is in the hallway and seeing if that's your patient or not. If it is, then you're responsible for being there. Um, but I think ideally there should be a page to the the team taking care of it. I believe. Yeah. Yeah. I know the ICUs get all the pages, like, right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's the key point is they will page you at some point, but the first one's going to be the overhead page probably that you'll hear, and then um, you know look out to see if that's your patient, and then you should be getting a page after that. Like you kind of get like routine from outside, like a lot of people just kind of like a lot of the time it's just kind of like very routine, very lab, and basically just yeah, kind of like, yeah. And I'll just say like if a patient is going downhill, just take your window about the team, just to the ICU. It's a 
lot more hectic, like coding on the floor. Yeah, I th yeah, so good points. Um, try to get the Mickey team involved early. I think a lot of times too, we, I think we as the um, primary team on the floor feel badly when our patient has to go to the MICU and we kind of blame ourselves and we're often hesitant to call a rapid or send her to the MICU. Um, I think as a, like an early second year, I, I've kind of felt that way, but as you go through training, you'll be like, no, this patient is pretty sick and needs to be in the MICU. And there's, there's really nothing you could have done earlier should blame yourself. Like the, there's patients that are going to get sicker um, and that they should be in the MICU. And you, your job is really to identify that. So don't feel badly if you have to call, you know, a rapid or um, to get MICU involved early. That's, that's not your fault. Your job is to triage that. Anything else? We're ready to, to go and face our own rapids by ourselves. Oh, yeah. Can I just say uh, we don't have overhead cages to take their hands? Um, and that's because of disruptive patients. But sometimes there can be a it, it concerns them a lot that someone came in an emergency. So we just cage the system all day. That's one of the reasons why. Yeah. So for those who couldn't hear, it's it's Heinz uses pager system only instead of the overhead. Um, to let the, the veterans sleep. And a lot of them have PTSD, PTSD too. So um, that'd be more disruptive in that environment. All right, thanks guys. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>